So here we're going to work an example using the conservation of energy equation that we developed using the Reynolds transport theorem. We are given a compressor and it's just a generic compressor. We don't have to worry too much about the specific geometry of it, which makes these problems a little bit easier. There's no angles or vector triangles we have to worry about. And air is entering the compressor at port 1 and leaving at port 2 with the conditions as shown. Um, it's entering at atmospheric P1 equals 14 0.7 psi absolute. We're going to use absolutes because we're going to end up using um, ideal gas equations here in, in a bit. Uh, V1 is essentially zero, so we're going to be able to ignore that. And the temperature at the inlet is a nice comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which works out to about, what is it, 540 Rankin. Oops, 530 Rankin. Sorry about that. At the outlet, we're told that the pressure, P2, is equal to 50 psi absolute, and that the temperature is equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit which is going to be equal to 560 degrees Rankin. We're told that the area at the outlet, we'll call it A2, is equal to one square foot. The airflow rate, the mass flow rate through the compressor is 20 pounds mass Per second and the power into the uh, into the compressor we'll call it W dot shaft is equal to 600 horsepower our job is to find the rate of heat transfer And we'll call it Q dot from the compressor, to or from the compressor. I guess we should say to the compressor. And then if it ends up being negative, we'll know that it's actually coming from the compressor. So we're going to make a number of uh, standard assumptions. We're going to assume steady flow inside the compressor. We're going to assume uniform flow across the inlet and the outlet. And we're going to treat the gas as, uh, as an ideal gas. We're going to assume that the velocities are um, perpendicular to the inlet and the out, or, or, or yeah, perpendicular to the control surface of the inlet and outlet. Uh, we're going to ignore changes in elevation, and uh, we're going to ignore the kinetic energy or the velocity coming in at the input, at the inlet. Sorry. So the first thing we're going to do, of course, is draw our control volume. around the compressor like that. And so we know that the only control surfaces where anything is actually crossing the, oh, sorry, any air is crossing our control, um, our, our boundary, are given by the solid red lines. And then of course there is shaft work being done and heat being um, input into the system where again, we're expecting Q, to, Q dot to be negative, but uh, by convention, we draw a positive Q dot as going into the system. So using what we know about the conservation of energy from, uh, that we developed from the, using the Reynolds transport theorem, we showed that M dot was equal to the enthalpy uh, per unit mass out minus the enthalpy in plus V naught squared minus V I, sorry, V out squared minus V I squared over two plus G times Z out minus Z in, the change in height. And all that has to be equal to 
the rate at which heat is being added to the system plus shaft work is being done on the system. Now I've used uh, the enthalpy H as equal to U plus P over rho because it will make our uh, it'll make the calculations here a little bit easier for us. Specifically, we know that the difference in enthalpy, oops, it's supposed to be an H, difference in enthalpy, H out minus H in, is going to equal, be equal to C sub P for air times T out minus T in uh, for an ideal gas, of course. Now, using our assumptions that we've made, well, we're going to ignore changes in elevation. We're going to ignore the kinetic energy of the flow coming in because uh, we're told that the velocity is, is close enough to zero. Um, and so we can now rewrite our equation as m dot c sub p times t2 minus, sorry, not t2, let me, let me, t out minus t in plus v out squared over 2 is equal to q dot in plus the shaft work being done. So the mass flow rate, we're told, is equal to, what did I say, 20 pounds mass per second. So we know the mass flow rate, we know the temperatures, we know C sub P for air, we know uh, W in, we're trying to find Q, the only thing left that we need to find is V out, which here I've called V, um, v O. And we can find that by knowing that um, for uniform flow across the outlet, that it has to be equal to the volumetric flow rate, which I'm going to call V dot in this case, so that it's not uh, not to be confused with Q dot, the, the, the rate of heat transfer, divided by the cross-sectional area, which is just going to be equal to the mass flow rate over rho, that gives us the, the uh, volumetric flow rate, over A2. And then using the ideal gas law, where P equals rho RT, we can substitute and get this is equal to the mass flow rate over the area at the outlet times R times the temperature at the outlet divided by the pressure at the outlet. And that's going to be equal to 20 pounds mass uh, per second. over one square foot, that's the outlet area, times R, which is 1,716 uh, foot-pounds per slug Rankin, but we need to get rid of a pound's mass, so we're going to divide that by 32.2 to give us 53 foot-pounds per pound mass Rankin times 560 Rankin is the temperature at the outlet, times uh, 1 over, our pressure is 50 PSI, pounds force per inch squared, and we need to convert that to square feet. So we need 144 square inches here, so we can cross off the square inches, we can cross off the square feet, we can cross off the pounds force, we can cross off the pounds mass, we can cross off the temperature in Rankin, we're left with feet per second, and uh, to be precise, 82.9 of them. So this is V, oh, I apologize that in my drawing I spoke of um, section one and section two. Obviously section one is the inlet, section two is the outlet, so I think that I have um, been a little loose and free with my subscripts here saying VO or V2 or AO or A2. Um, hopefully it's clear.
We're solving for Q in, so we write that as Q in equals all of this on the right hand side. We get m dot times c sub p t out minus t in plus v out squared over 2 minus w in at the shaft. We're, we're applying 600 horsepower to our compressor, so uh, because we're applying um, power into our control volume, uh, w dot will be positive, and then we're subtracting off on the end here, so we'll end up subtracting um, a negative number. But now we know all the pieces that we need to know, so we just have to do a little more arithmetic. We have 20 pounds mass per second times 0 0.24 BTUs per pound mass Rankine, that's um, C sub P for air, times the temperature difference, which is 560 minus 530, or 100 Fahrenheit minus 70 Fahrenheit. Either way, it's going to be 30 Rankine. Plus our velocity, which we just said was uh, 82.9 feet per second squared over 2 minus 600 horsepower. Um, but we convert that to, let's see, 550 foot, that's a 5 there, 550 foot pounds, pounds force, per horsepower <coughs> second. So one horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second. And uh, we'll convert that to BTUs as one BTU is equal to 778, I'm sure you all know this off the top of your head, foot-pounds force. And we go through with our calculator and push a whole bunch of buttons, and I get minus 277 BTUs per second. Now we said that we would draw Q in being positive into our system, and we got a negative number, so that really means that we're actually losing heat <clears throat> from our control volume that's being radiated away, or, or convected, or conducted, whatever, what, what have you. It's, it's waste heat that's being lost from our compressor, and it's basically the inefficiency of the compressor um, due to the fact that, of course, no compressor can be uh, purely ideal.